All right. Our next talk is by Jonas. Uh, he's been a contributor since 2015. He organizes the Knicks London Meetup with Thomas Hunger and is now working as a Knicks contractor. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So t today I want to talk to you about uh, using Knicks at work. Uh, the title is a bit uh, facetious, but basically I want to show how you take a code base from work or customer and Nixify it. And there's different stages that you will see uh, that you have to go through. So just for a quick history, so September last year, I was tired of hacking Nix on the side, and so I decided to quit, quit my job and become a Nix contractor. Uh, but there's not a uh, lot of work around uh, yet. And after a while I met uh, with Twig and they have really cool customers. And I was able to do a lot of Nix stuff with them. And now I joined uh, Twig and they're doing sort of R and applied uh, computer science. So it's kind of a R&D lab for other customers. Um, all right, so the program is really uh, to show you the different stages. There's going to be First phase is next shell, then you want to package your things, and finally you set up your CI. Okay, so I can't really show the customer's code, so I built a little app. Um, I actually took some of the source code from a project called ToDo MVC, and then I Nixified it. And you can find uh, all of the source code over there. So if I'm going a bit quickly through the slides, you can always uh, have a look on the repo. And you can see the file structure is basically you have one backend, one frontend, and the backend is a Haskell project and it has two components, and the frontend is uh, just some bunch of JavaScript. And um, yeah, first thing is Nix shell. So you know you you just drop a shell that Nix in the project, and your um, your colleagues ask you what is this file, and you say don't worry about it. <laughs> 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 and then at some point, suddenly they have problem with system dependencies, and then you're like, oh, uh, you could try to fix it, or you can install Nix and just run Nix shell, and it's going to be fine. And basically, <laughs> um, the shell that Nix file would look something like that, so you import uh, Nix packages, and then you set create the derivation, and the important part is the build inputs where you put all the system dependencies that you need. And then a last feature of Nix shell is you can uh, run some bash scripts that uh, in this case would source the .n file that contains uh, typically environment variables for the project. Um, right, so that's kind of the version zero. And so one thing you might notice is you have to put a name, you have to put a source, which is always null or some path, but it's not really relevant. So I think we should introduce a um, MK shell that just simplifies the, the process. And also uh, that pulls in all of the build inputs from your different packages that you're going to define later on. All uh, right, so here I'm using an uh, overlay, and so I can pretend it's already in the next picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it's in the project, and uh, my intention is to submit a PR at some point. Or if you want to do it, you're welcome. Uh, the other thing that's important, or that can trick you quite easily, is if you run Next Shell in dash dash pure mode, then lots of the tools that you have available are not going to be there. And usually, if you customize your bash RC, then suddenly you're going to have uh, failures. And so that's why this first line is quite common. You find it on most Debian distributions. And then I recommend to add this second line, uh, which is something that uh, basically escapes the config of your bash RC if you're in the pure mode, or just any uh, next shell, actually. All right. so. 
you can even uh, start running things uh, in the next shell without really stepping into it by using the dash dash run command. And now any you can m even plug this into your CI and now you build with the next shell. And it's not really pure, but it kind of does the job. OK, so that's the first stage. And it works, but it's not really pure. And I would say the main issue is that it's not composable. Because one of the really cool things about Nix is that you can take, make a derivation, and then compose it and make another derivation. And that's the really the power of Nix. And something you don't find with Docker files, for example. And so you would build packages. Or, um, I'm not really going to th go uh, really into how to make packages. The main recommendation I have is read Nix packages. There's lots of examples out there. But basically, it looks a little bit like that. You have a package name. Then you specify the source. And then you have different types of inputs, uh, which you should probably learn, because not everyone knows. So the native build inputs are tools that you use to build, but are not going to be part of the output. And this is important, especially for people who do cross-compilation. Then there's the propagated build inputs, which are tools that you might use for build, but you also want to install afterwards. So they kind of come with, like, if you have a binary dependencies, and then the build inputs that probably everyone knows. Uh, you also want to learn about the different types of phases that are different types of outputs. And yeah. So for this project, we have some Haskell uh, packages. And I'm not going to go too much into details. But right now, in this space, you have multiple tools. So you have Kabal to Nix, Stackage to Nix. Uh, you can also try to use the, pa the just the Haskell packages that are in the Nix packages. You can also use the Stack tool, which is a, a tool that's in the Haskell community, and it has a dash dash Nix mode. But basically, all it does it pulls GHC from the Nix star, but that's it. Or you can swap things around and create a derivation that invokes a Stack, and it's maybe impure, but uh, you can. Uh, maybe control the s dependencies a little bit better. And for the node part, uh, with Martin, where is Martin? Ah, there it is. Uh, we worked on uh, this project that's called Yarn to Nix. And what it, d it does is, uh, so Yarn is a Facebook project that tries to replace NPM. And the good thing about it is it generates a log file that contains the hashes of all of the packages that you depend on. Sorry? Of the downloaded, of the downloaded uh, package from NPM. OK, I have a question. Can, can you? OK. <laughs> um, so the cool thing about this is that actually what we do is, so the first phase was to uh, do like any other languages where you do a yarn to Nix project that generates a Nix file from your log file. But then you r we realized that actually this operation was pure because all the inputs is the hashes from the other file. So now we can import from the output another, we can import the next file that's generated. And we don't need to compute any checksums, which means that basically your yarn package uh, doesn't have any uh, shells. That's the magic. So what it does, it uh, takes the name from the package.json, the version from the package.json. So you can see the name attributes is missing here. And you don't have a uh, shards for the rest of the dependencies. OK, so this is a slide I wanted to finish earlier, but I didn't get the time. <laughs> it was actually taking on uh, one of the talks we were uh, seeing earlier, where what I do is I, instead of making one derivation while I run the tests, I tend to create multiple derivation, one that has the build outputs and another that has the tests. And because Nix is composable, you can do that. And it's really nice because sometimes you just want to build your project and you don't want to run the test again. 
because maybe there are integration tests and they take a long time to build. But if you change the do check attributes, then you're forced to rebuild. So uh, it's kind of a way to be more uh, dynamic. OK, so w one thing that's missing here is <laughs> you see the RC SRC inputs. Uh, is actually pointing to your current folder, which is where you have all your uh, node modules. And all of your source code is going to be inserted into the next star at build time. But you don't want to have the node modules folder be inserted into the next star. So there's a, a built in that's called build, uh, built in that filter source. And you pass a function, you pass uh, an absolute path, with a, which is where you have your source code and it gives you a next star. And the function itself um, gets the absolute path of each of the files. So it's, it uh, goes through the files of your project and then invokes the function. And if it returns true, it keeps the, the file. And so you get the absolute path to the file and the file type, which is uh, like a file or a directory or maybe a symlink. And in the next packages, there is one uh, tool that exists that's called lib.cleansource, which basically removes the result file that you would ha get from a next build. So you don't, if you don't do that, you're going to run next build. And you run next build again, and it builds again, because it's inserted the results from the previous build. And so you kind of are in an infinite loop. Uh, and it's nice, but it doesn't really compose. So Typically, you would have to rewrite it or make a function. So what I propose is that we change a couple of things to filter source. First, I think uh, the function should return true if we should remove it. So invert the Boolean logic, because it's more natural. Um, if you look in the, I think, in next packages, oh, you're not going to see it here. OK, just trust me, but the clean source function is actually doing exactly that for a lot of conditions and then adding a nut in front. So I think it's more natural to have it this way. And then I ins have a second function that allows you to compose these filters. And that way, you can take the clean source from next packages and then add your own special uh, cleaning functions. All right, so now we have uh, we have packages. And there's a last thing we need to do to make it really nice. And it's pinning next packages. So what's happening right now is you have your project with all your derivation that are being built. But uh, each colleague might, have, might be on a different channel. And so they might actually get different results, which kind of uh, yeah, the point of Nix is to have reproducible builds, well, one of them actually. So I went through a different, different phases of how, what is the best way to pin Nix packages. Um, so the main, like the tri trivial version, the uh, version zero, <coughs> is you use the built-in called fetch tarball and you say fetch the Nix packages from this SHA on GitHub. And that's it. And you get back the source code, and then you can import it. And it works pretty well. I mean, the only issue is that every time you invoke uh, next build or next shell, it's going to try to re-download it. And one solution is to upgrade to next 1.12, and then add the uh, SHA-256. But then your colleagues who are still on next 1.11, it's not going to work anymore, because the SHA attribute is not supported in that case. <coughs> so then the next idea was, OK, maybe we can import fet, uh, you know, fetch from GitHub that we love and use and all over Next packages and just fetch the source like that. And it works also really well until you set the Next path to this file, because then you're importing Next packages from itself and you have an infinite loop. OK, so then uh, the next idea was, so this one, you're not really supposed to read it, but it's a bit crazy. And it's, it's been 
invented by a guy called Taktwa, which I don't think is there today. But basically, he re-implements uh, fetch URL, uh, fetch tarball, uh, by, in this line, he finds the config of Nix, and it's a secret file, well, I didn't know it exists, and it contains the reference to all of the built-ins that are used to build the Nix utility. And so you can actually, without importing Nix packages, already have access to gzip and tarball. And you wrap this in a derivation, and you put a SHA-256, and you're good. Um, until you do Nix build the uh, option sandbox true, and then <laughs> Because these paths are actually, they come from the next star, but they are not, uh, they're strings and they're not really paths, and that breaks the system. So I was a bit disappointed because I really like how convoluted and <laughs> <laughs> there's a special place in my heart for this kind of hacks. <laughs> So in the end, I think we should just uh, have a compatibility layer for a fetch tarball that switches on the next version, and that's it. That's the best way I found currently. All right, so now we have uh, the source of next packages. Okay, I have a question from Domen. All right, so Domen made it work, and he's going to show us clever. Okay, cool. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to give the talk, is to get this kind of feedback. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one more to-do slide. Uh, basically, you should really have updater scripts, because now you're f probably tracking uh, 1709, and you want to get the latest security updates, and to make it easy, you need a script that you can invoke either by hand or by CI. But that's really the last step that we need to standardize and make it easy, because Otherwise, all the good work you know that's been done by the security people uh, is kind of wasted. Okay, uh, so we have the source, but there's a last step that you have to do, and is when you import. So we're all familiar with this: import brackets next packages, and then you have an empty attribute set. And actually, you're supposed to set some stuff in there. <laughs> You're supposed to set the empty config and the overlays, because the, uh, if you don't do the empty config, then each uh, user can have its own config, and then it's not pure anymore. And the same for the overlays, plus overlays are cool, so you should really use them. All right, so now we have our Nix, uh, uh, Nixify um, repo. Each of the different components has a default that Nix. And then in the old packages, you kind of call package into old package is the overlay, and you call package to load off these components. The default dot next is the one that ties everything together. Uh, the next package is SRC is the version four, and the release dot next is just gonna re-export er everything from default dot next that you're interested to build for your project. Because default next contains all of next packages plus your project packages, and that's it. Oh wait, this is just a like nifty trick I found out uh, just like last week. Is usually you have a scripts folder where you have tons of uh, scripts, right, uh, specific to the project, and one of the thing that you can do is if you set the dash i next packages equal next. And Nix is the folder that we have here, right? And so now we, you're reusing all of the same setup that you were using before, and you're not, again, diverging with the packages that you're using. Uh, only downside is you have to invoke your scripts from the roots of your repo. All right, so last step, set up the CI. So the general approach is just going to be next build, uh, next release, that next file, and that's it. And I think most of the logic should go into the next files. And then maybe later on you're going to add some impure stuff, for example, pushing Docker packages or talking to Kubernetes or something like that. 
So the other thing is um, you're coming at an existing place where they already have a CI in place. So one thing you're going to see from this list is Hydra is missing. And I actually tried all of these CIs. And basically, I just want to go thr quickly through all of them and show you uh, the advantages and disadvantages. So uh, Travis. Travis is the first CI that had Nix support uh, after Hydra. And it's, it's doing a good job. And it's probably working better on smaller projects. But it's a bit hard to debug, and it's sometimes it's a bit slow. And but it works all right. And then there's a uh, circular CI 2.0. It's Docker based, and you can restart your builds, and you can get SSH into the container. So it's kind of handy sometimes to debug things. The the only issue is that they have a immutable cache. So if you want to store the next store for the next build, the problem is you need to give the uh, unique hash. And the unique hash is going to be, I don't know, something. But if it changes, then you have to redownload all your next store. So it's not, I don't know, I'm a bit annoyed by this, actually. <laughs> I don't know if there's a better way to do it. But basically, it's kind of they're working one against each other. and. It's actually quite common with the next store and other caching system is that if they're not perfectly aligned, so I would say if they don't have the exact same notion of hashing, I would say, I'm not really sure, but uh, it makes things a bit difficult. In the Travis case, I think they just load the latest stuff from S3 and then redump it back, and so most of the time it works all right. Um, so it's actually an advantage for us that they're not too pure. <laughs> Um, all right, so GitLab is also really cool. It's uh, agent-based, so you can uh, run the agent on NixOS and then have GitLab uh, manages uh, schedules all of the jobs, and you have good control on the targets. And it's already in the NixOS Nix packages. The only downside is that you need to move all your source code to GitLab. So if you have already your own workflow around GitHub or some other CI, um, source control. Uh, it's not very handy. But overall, GitLab on, uh, on its own is also pretty good. Then there's uh, Jenkins. I don't know if I need to talk about it. but <laughs> It's actually, they're making a lot of efforts to make it work. But I tried. Even last month, I was still trying to make it work, and I spent a lot of time just fixing things. So maybe it was because I tried to make it work on Kubernetes. I don't know. OK, so last one is BuildKites. And it's a commercial thing. But uh, the agent is open source, and it's already in the next packages. And then they control the dashboard and the job scheduler. And it seems to work pretty well. It's configured as well with there's a pipeline that you can uh, configure with a YAML file. But you can also dynamically generate the YAML file. So the next thing I want to explore is see how I can split up the builds by invoking next build, finding all of the outputs that are going to be built, and then maybe generate a YAML from that, and then like shelve out the builds. I don't know. So if you have any ideas, uh, let me know after the talk. All right, so we have a CI now, or one of these. Uh, but don't forget about the binary cache, uh, especially if you're doing Haskell development. Uh, it would be really nice if you could take, most of the time, the builds from the binary cache, and you would just save a lot of time. Also, in, in some of these cases, when you're scaling the number of nodes, it's really nice to be able to download from the binary cache, because otherwise, you're just going to have one node that's rebuilding from scratch, and it takes two hours. So to do that, what you do is, um, so I didn't know about next 1.12 uh, features, which looks really, really cool. But uh, so I had to build my own uh, little wrapper that 
basically uh, invokes the next push and then uh, use, uh, in this case, it's sends to Google Cloud Storage. And it works pretty well. The only issue is when the NAR files are big files like uh, uh, Docker containers or something like that, it can take a lot of time to, to build. So I, d I don't know if there's a, it's a optimization problem or something, but it would be nice. Sorry? Don't push Docker containers. Yes. <laughs> And but that's not enough. So that's the first side, and then the second side is uh, setting up the clients. And right now you have to change the system config to allow your um, to allow uh, to fetch from the binary cache. And unless you're in a single user mode, I think so. It's actually different if you're in single or multi user mode. So now you have to ask your colleagues. You know. Are you using the single user or something? So it makes things a little bit complicated. But as we learned recently with Next 1.12, it's going to be solved. All right, so maybe last bit. How, how am I on time? All right. I feel like I spoke already enough, but. All <laughs> uh, right, so Docker content, I think. One of the cool things about Nix is the composability, which I mentioned before. And one of the things you can do is take your package, so in that sense, uh, that in that one is the front end, and just put it into this other derivation that's going to produce a Docker container. And your Docker container is going to contain just a minimal amount of stuff that you need to ship into production, just the runtime dependencies. So in that case, you have uh, the um, the w the web uh, the index.html some JavaScript and then Caddy which is a web server. All right, and that's a nice hack, but I'm running out of time. So um, this is how you can rebuild next. You can reuse the Next.js module system to build a container, and that's just pushing the containers. So that's it. We started with the next shell, then we did the 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 revisions and then we set up the CI and now we're we're good. Thank you. Is there a time for questions? Yeah. All right. No, over there. Yeah, so small question about this uh, filter source example and uh, mm -hmm. the node modules folder. Uh, did you never run into uh, uh, any problems with that? Because, for example, uh, some packages may also declare bundled uh, node modules, and they may use uh, slightly different uh, packages than the upstream versions. And uh, I don't know if you've ever run into trouble with that. Uh, um, not that I recall. Okay, because yeah. I've seen a couple of packages that uh, that really require the, the bundled node modules folders to uh, to work. Oh right. So okay. yeah, you may want to make that optional uh, because in general it's a good thing that yeah you clear uh, you clear out uh, the mess, but sometimes you actually need the the node modules folder that is in your project. Mm, okay. Thanks. There's a question over there. Hi. Um. So I, I, I can't quite believe that I'm uh, about to defend Jenkins, and I, I feel dirty already for, for, for doing that. Uh, but actually, <laughs> we, we, uh, we, I, I, I'm not a fan of Jenkins, but we do use it at uh, Holy Jack because we have Nix builds uh, which, which, aren't, uh, which aren't pure. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's actually working pretty well for us. So we've got everything like uh, is, the, is, is defined in a declarative way, and um, we have all the pack uh, all the plugins pinned, um, and it's working. It's working really well. Like I'm, I'm not loving Jenkins, but it's pretty easy to set up um, and to use for for Nix stuff. So, yeah, okay, that that's my experience. So I think I agree with the. So what Jenkins did is they introduced a Jenkins file that you can add to your repo, and this part is very declarative now, and they also did a lot of work on cleaning up. So the default setup now is going to integrate with GitHub more properly because there was lots of work to do, for example, 
uh, just make sure that it pushed the build states to the GitHub PR, stuff like that. So that's much better. But you still have a snowflake problem where the config on its own of Jenkins is not declarative. Okay, maybe it's declarative. All right. Um, so, have you had to think much about distribution of channel? Uh, and what I mean by that is those uh, source references with path file, uh, you know, dot slash path dot, mm -hmm. um, become very painful, at least in my experience in the similar problem, when you, uh, when you actually want to distribute your software to other people using Nix. Uh, and um, I was wondering if you encountered that or if you had any thoughts of that. Or, um, or you want me to clarify and actually explain what I mean by that? Or <laughs> so in, in general, what I have is a self-contained repo hmm. where I don't, the, the, the artifacts I'm pushing out are Docker containers and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So maybe I'm not in country in the okay. same issue. Yeah, that would solve it. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Ah, there's a last question. <laughs> Just for the um, for the slide that you ran out of time, would you be around after the closing? Yeah, yeah sure. I'm gonna publish the slides because online. I think like actually getting uh, the full Nixos with services to run in Docker. I think that's rather interesting. So right. So it generates the Nix um, file system, but you don't have system D in the container. So this thing, it would be nice if we could solve it. Actually, and I agree. Any further questions? Thank you. Thank you.